Welcome to RTS Confessions. This week, we talked to Chris, a veteran of the war in Afghanistan. Chris grew up a street kid in a violent Birmingham, Alabama neighborhood. The stress and unpredictability of his environment at home perfectly primed him for the hell he would go through in Afghanistan. We talked about operating drones to kill, dealing with suicide bombers, the business of war, and his new life as a fighter in the world of jujitsu. Timestamps are below. Enjoy. You were a kind of a fighter, a street fighter. Yes. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of I, the town I grew up in, is like a lot of violence there, a lot of poverty, stuff like that. So he's kind of. What was the of town? The, Birmingham, Alabama. Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah. I think the last year I lived there it was the sixth most dangerous city in America. Really? Was it meth? A lot of meth, like running through that town. No, just poverty, crime, a lot of a lot of gun violence, a lot of armed robbery, stuff like that. So, like, what kind of stuff were you getting into? Um, I was on pro. I got on probation when I was 15. I was on probation when I was 15. I'm trying to remember what I did to get on probation. I violated my probation when I was 16 for a stolen car and a minor in possession of a handgun. So uh, I was already on probation. I violated my probation. The cops were looking for me. I had kind of ran away from home. My mother kind of threw me out of the house. And um, they would come through my neighborhood looking for me, and I'd have to run on foot from the cops on like a regular basis. Wow. And they would park at my bus stop to wait for me wow. to, to try to go to school so they could arrest me on the way to school. So I stopped going to school. Yeah. I got kicked out of high school. I got my GED. I for joined, what? What'd you get kicked out for? Fit too many absences. If you have like twenty plus absences in one semester, like I had to stop yeah. going because they would yeah. be parked at my bus stop. Yeah. So uh, I joined the military as soon as I turned eighteen. I got my GED and like got out of there, and that was it for me. I just kind of took off after that. How do you first start getting into that shit? Just the neighborhood I lived in. Yeah. You can either stay inside all the time, or you can go be part of the community. So mm -hmm. that was just kind of it, like. The neighborhood I lived in, like just the way the dynamic was between the community and the police is like if you're out with everybody just hanging out and the, you see the police come around the corner, everybody just runs automatically. Everyone. Wow. Everybody. Everybody yeah. runs automatically. Just because if whoever's left standing out there, that's who's going to get patted down and all that stuff. So Yeah. So the cops were kind of just targeting your community a lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, it's not like, chances are they're going to find something on somebody because yeah. the laws there are different. You know what I mean? Yeah. You go to jail for a little bag of weed there yeah. so is uh birmingham segregated racially? voluntarily now it's yeah, still I mean, very yeah. segregated but like yeah people don't that's what i learned i grew up like age th through 12 in a rural part of the community where there were not a lot of minorities there was a lot of like country white people mm -hmm. my stepdad was black so they didn't really like us there we weren't really accepted there mm -hmm. we moved into the city and they were more tolerant of like interracial stuff but at the same time they didn't like white people Hmm. So I kind of saw it from both sides. Yeah. And what I learned is it's like kind of people just teaching it to their kids. So they are kind of, it was kind of one of those situations where I lived in the neighborhood and they were like, you're cool, but like, we don't like white people. But, and vice versa. And vice versa. Very yeah. much so. Yeah. 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 I mean, Alabama has a reputation a that it precedes yeah. itself, you know? Right. And a lot of people wonder, what's that really like? Like the racism in, in like the deep rural South. Yeah. It's something that you're kind of always aware of. Yeah. You were a, a, a street kid. Yeah. A street kid. Yep. What, drug dealing, robbery? Not really. Like, I was the only white kid in my neighborhood, so it's hard to be a drug dealer in that scenario. Uh, right. You're going to get just robbed by everybody else. So yeah. I didn't really deal drugs. I was in a lot of trouble. I would steal, steal stuff. I was on probation. I got caught with a stolen car. Mm -hmm. I got caught with a pistol just because it's not safe there. You know what right. I mean? So, like, you don't want to be the only person without a gun. Being the only white kid, would you have to prove yourself? Yeah. Yeah. R early on. You I still remember lot. one of my best friends having a conversation with me like, Chris, you're going to have to not take any shit off of nobody. Yeah. Otherwise, this is going to keep happening every day. Yeah. So So you you built a reputation for yourself then? Yeah, the, the crazy white boy. So, <laughs> And after a while, things smooth out, especially in the neighborhood. Nobody wants to have a problem with somebody that lives two blocks away, and you got to worry about me like setting your car on fire in the middle of the night. Is that something you did? Nah, nah, nah. That sounds illegal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you just got to do. But, uh, well, uh, there's a statute of limitations, right? Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Garbage can, whatever, you know, just gotta get your point across. Um, so like you would just, it was almost like first day of prison mentality yep. every day. It yeah. smoothed out. I smoothed out in the neighborhood, but then you still got to go to school, you know, or just and just deal with the city in general. You mentioned that you, you went to Afghanistan, you went to war. Yeah. And it seems like being at war. It's like that constant state of anxiety. I explain that to people. I've been to the Persian Gulf twice. We did a two week trip to Somalia and I've been to Afghanistan twice. And I think Birmingham is probably the most dangerous place I've ever been. Really? Yeah. And like, but you, you acclimated yourself to that. Yeah. To that fear. Like you, you just, 
it right. became normal to you. Yes. Yeah. The expectation of it not being there doesn't really exist. So it mm. just kind of seems normal. Do you still live with that? I not, live it's, with it's, the you get results programmed of that it. way. Right. I live with the results of it. Yeah. Where even though I'm in a night like San Diego's a nice town, I still have some of the reactions that might have been a survival uh instinct. Right. Tool. Tool. And I don't necessarily need it. As much. What, what do you mean by that? Just like the way I could be very defensive. Like respect is a big thing where I come from. If I feel like somebody's offended me, they may not even realize it, yeah. but I have to, you know, remind myself like it's not that serious. Like, yeah. you know, and just my first reaction to not be, uh, to look for violence is like the first solution, you know, yeah. kind of thing. So, yeah. When was the last time you've been in a, a like a street fight? Not since I started training jujitsu. Mm. So I take that back. I, once. I got in one one fight, kind of, if you want to call it a fight. I got into it with a dude on the freeway, uh, and I blocked traffic. I got in front of him and stopped my car and kind of like hit him with his own car door a couple times. <laughs> and then got back in my car and drove off. So if that counts as a fight, I guess. But for the most part, not really since I started training martial arts. Yeah. One of the things I've learned it's is an outlet. When, when you get, you no longer have the fear of what the outcome will be, you can use your head a little bit more to navigate mm -hmm. social situations. Yeah. Instead of just, a lot of people swing first out of fear. Right. Uh, when you're not worried about it as much, you can sort of deal with things. Because you're just confident you can like tool up anyone. Right. <laughs> right. To a degree. I mean, most people, yeah. People say that guys that are, you know, really proficient at, you know, MMA are actually less likely to fight. You know? That's been my experience. They have, they have an outlet. And it's actually healthy for guys like Eric, who used to love to fight. Like that guy needs to be in MMA. Yes. Because like, yes. if he doesn't have that outlet, it's not going to be good. Well, we're built for combat to a degree. When you don't have it, you'll find it somewhere. That's why people like sports. It's like right. simulated scrimmage or playing Call of Duty on video games. You yeah. still have to kind of like we haven't evolved as much as we think we have. Yeah. So you have to kind of fill that in somewhere. If not, you're going to get in a fight at the bar yeah. or something. So it's interesting to think like did a lot of guys who you served with come from a similar upbringing? Yeah. 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 yeah you see people if you got you have don't get me wrong. There's still duty, you know, but there's you have a lot of people that it's circumstances why they join the military or mm -hmm. a lack of opportunity. Right. And then maybe you develop right. the sense of duty right. as you get into it. But it's funny, like a lot of black kids grow up in that environment, but you yep. don't see a lot of them going into the military as, as much Not as you as see. Not as much. Like, That's a good point. That's a good point. Because I, I think they don't feel, I feel they feel a little divorced from American culture. Yes. The government. Yeah. A lot of my friends, I had one friend that I yeah. grew up in the neighborhood with. He lives in San Diego now too. We grew up one block down the street from each, from each other. He joined about a year after I did just because I was able to kind of convince people like, it's not like this everywhere, you yeah, know. Uh, yeah. There's nice places to live out here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he joined, but my other friends just—it's almost like a non-belief of that, that something could work for me. Like I could go out there and just like give it my all, and opportunities will open up. There's, yeah. It's almost like they there's a lack of belief that there's anything other than what we have currently, yeah. and that's just going to be what it is. Yeah. So. You joined the military at 18. How soon after that did we go to war? I went on my first deployment in 2001. I had joined the, the military at the end of 99. So about a year and a half, I think. Okay. I went to the, the first deployment I did. We weren't really at war yet, but we kind of were. It was like the, in between the two Gulf Wars where we still just kind of bombed Iraq the whole time for those eight years. So I did that on a deployment. I went on my second deployment when the war had officially started and we dropped the same amount of ordnance. Yeah. So it really wasn't much different between yeah. the Operation Southern Watch and the war. You were in charge of doing the drones. At the time, I was F-18 avionics, fighter jets. Okay. So I would do all the all the cockpit instrumentation, the computers from a fighter plane. When they break, I take them apart, put them back together, get them back in the plane, get the plane back in the air so it can do what it does. You see that uh, crash that happened in Texas recently? It was an old like World was, War II plane or something. One of them was, and one uh, of them I think was more modern. Okay. I heard about it. I didn't read much. It of was it. pretty crazy to look at. Yeah. I don't understand why we need to still be flying though, especially the one that crashed. It had like a whole crew of people and it's like a, yeah. a plane from the silent film era. Well, it's an air show, you know? Right. Yeah. I, yeah. And I guess I, I didn't really think about it until there's a loss of like six people. Like, why are we, yeah. I, I guess the plane was maintained. I don't know. I just, I, I try, I struggle to find the reason behind. What do you think would have death. gone wrong in a situation like that? I think probably the, something mechanical of the aircraft. 
I mean, so it was like a mechanic. It wasn't like a pilot error. I, I didn't read about it. I yeah. assumed that when the plane the, crashed. The, the, the crash is frightening to see because like right. it just like, I mean, the only thing like it that I've seen is the two towers. Like the amount of explosiveness that comes from a plane right. is pretty incredible. Oh, it must have had a lot of fuel in it then. Yeah. 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 Um, it's unfortunate. So when did you start with the drones? I got into the drones. I got off active duty. I did two trips to the Persian Gulf doing fighter, like basically living on an aircraft carrier, launching planes, bombing Iraq. I got done with that. I came back and I switched over to contracting, which is basically kind of like being a mercenary. We, we use the word contractor now, but you're doing a military job as a civilian for more money and they can sort of sidestep a lot. Like militaries are, are bound by rules of engagement, the Geneva Convention, stuff like that. So they can hire civilian contracting companies to kind of sort of get around some of that. Mm. So I went to work for a civilian contracting company doing Predator UAV maintenance. So th that whole thing is avionics. So, so what were you trying to get around? Were I'm not saying we were to trying around? to get any, around anything. They hire civilian contract companies because the... Like let's say, like the Blackwater scandal, they they shot up a bunch of like a whole marketplace full of people, and uh, you know as far as the government and the military goes, they can just fire Blackwater, and right? Then like they it's don't have the, to worry the heat's about not on them. They don't have to worry about the integrity of it's, the military. It's just it's right. it's uh it's insurance against bad right. PR. Yeah, it's a it's a civilian company you can just fire as opposed to your whole military integrity being called into question. Yeah, it's kind so, of fucked up how they think like that. Right, <laughs> yeah. right, right, right. And but you know, I mean, honestly, they, of course they think like that because right. that's it's it's business to them at the end of the day. There was a lot of business going on back then too. Yeah. We, I think we've changed some of the rules about how we can use contractors, but it was a big money thing back then too. You got you had like Dick Cheney was on the, the board of directors at Halliburton yeah. who got like 90% of the contracts during yeah. that, that war, you know? Yeah. So there's a lot of that going on. Take me through what it was like operating these these drone you said it's like right. a, it's like a remote control plant. yeah it's a, it's made out of fiberglass they're they're fairly big like about the size of from wingtip to wingtip and and nose to tail it would probably take up this room wow so you put you could put a couple of missiles on the wings depending on what model it is uh you launch it there's a metal van basically that you sit inside of with the pilots and they're kind of just sitting in it looks like a flight simulator yeah and they launch it and fly it with that and you're just kind of watching on the screen like a video game it's in like infrared game. high definition and it, it's like very responsive, like yeah, 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 very good. The camera is the most high tech thing on it. The plane itself is just a remote control airplane. Yeah, um, the camera is pretty high tech. Like from a mile up in the air, you can zoom in and count the hairs on somebody's beard, and they can't even hear it. They don't even know it's up there. So you use these things, and then how do you pinpoint your targets? Laser guided. Uh, within the camera, there's a laser. You lock onto it with the laser. And, so with the camera, you could see basically like an individual, or yeah. I'm, you could count the hairs on their beard with this camera from a wow. mile up in the air. Wow. You can watch ants cross the road. So it, it zooms in really, really tight. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And it has a laser in it. So you lock on with the laser and the missile follows the laser. So and if they move, you can just follow them with the laser. And it's a bomb. Missile, yeah. It's so it's not just going to kill that one person. Uh. It, they're small missiles, and you can sort of adjust the missile. It's, it's an AGM-114 Hellfire missile. So, I mean, if there's people standing next to them, for sure, it's not going to just kill them. It's going to kill everybody standing next to them. If they're in a building, it's going to be the building. Okay. Uh, but it's not big enough where it's going to take out a whole block or anything like that. But for sure, there's collateral damage. You know what I mean? If there's yeah. kids outside playing soccer and you got to blow the building up, they're going to get hit with flying chunks of concrete. So, How often do you see things like that happen? More than once. Does it desensitize you to it, the fact that it's kind of distant and it's on a screen? No, because like a fighter pilot goes over and they drop a bomb and they keep going. You stay there and watch it in high definition. Yeah. So it's infrared, warm things glow. So you're looking at body parts and blood puddles while they're still warm. Wow. Kind of thing. Yeah. That's why. When the missile comes in, you just see a white flash of light because it's hot at first. Yeah. And then you see, we call it bits and pieces uh, of just whatever is left. So it's like, it's that like red, green, yellow. It's white and black. White and black. That's thermal. That's thermal. Yeah. We, infrared is just white and black. Got it. Um, so, uh, like, what are some of the targets that you remember as being like? I signed a non disclosure agreement. I can talk about some stuff. Right. The, the rule of thumb is if it made the news, I can talk about it. What made the news? I think we killed the leader of the Taliban maybe three times. Uh, wow. There's a rank structure, so somebody else gets promoted. Uh, we killed one of bin Laden's sons, one of his favorite sons. You so pushed the button on that. 
I don't push the button. The pilot pushes the button. I just okay. sit next to him and okay. tell him that all his systems are good. Got it. Yeah. Uh, one of his sons had been on house arrest in Iran and got off house arrest somehow, went straight to uh, Pakistan or Afghanistan. And uh, we got him in a building. We got one of Bin Laden's father-in-laws had had some type of surgery. And he was watching uh, the sun go down on the roof Why of the house. Why was his father-in-law on target? Because a lot of his family would work with him as like high-ranking positions in his in the organization. Okay. So some of them didn't. Some of his kids didn't like want to be associated with it. Yeah. So we left them alone. There's so many storylines that go on with yeah. these people that the public isn't really aware about. Like, right. you know, who are these people? Like. Why are these people a target, you right. know? Um, or do you know like about these people? Like what are some of the things that they did? Because I'm sure you have to like right. justify it in your head. Like, okay, these are bad people. Right, it would be no different than let, let's say you're at war with a foreign army and right. you have like the leader and then you have generals under them. We're talking about the generals. Okay. So they're integral in the whole rank structure, the planning of attacks, the planning of, you know, cause it, Aside from the 9-11 attack, they're constantly attacking us over there too, like um, planning stuff like that. Like we had side bombers at our gate, people shoot stuff over the fence all the time. We had this outdoor bazaar uh, where we would just go shop, like I could buy bootleg DVDs there. I saw the hookah in my bedroom that I bought there. <laughs> and uh, they sent a six-year-old kid in there with a suicide vest, stuff like that. Six-year-old so, kid. Yeah. So the way it works is they kind of operate like the mob. Like They come around, they, they, off, they provide protection and you give them money. And if you, or you can give them one of your kids and like wipe your debt out for life, knowing they're gonna strap a bomb on this kid. So, wow. Yeah, that was a rough one. Um, That's disgusting. Like, yeah, just like look on the kid's face. Oh my God. Cause he didn't wanna do it. He was just scared, terrified. We found out, we have informants that we pay in there. I say we, the, the whole group. Um, so they knew that, that it was gonna sort of happen. So we, they call it the meat market where they search everybody before they go in. And they found him like right off the bat, but just, I don't know, it's just, that that's the sort of stuff that sticks with you. You know, you think of everything's course. black and white before you go. There's good guys and bad guys. The gray area is a mile wide and that's the yeah. shit you gotta live with, you know? What do you do with the kid after that? You can't give him back to the parents. You know what I mean? These are the people that are supposed to be biologically programmed to love him, you know? Yeah. Do you find that a lot of soldiers talk up how bad these people are? Cause you said there's a lot of gray area. Like are right. some of these people like, just doing their job and their job is basically when you say like, these people these these people who might be in the Taliban right you know if they're just generals they're just on a different side they believe it, what they believe yes and no to a degree you know they're a product of their upbringing also they believe that they you know their cause is just but the way i look at it is when you're doing things like you know they figured out that we weren't searching kids and women the same way we were searching the men so they start putting the bombs on the women and right. kids and stuff like that that's yeah. where i kind of feel like mm, it's not the same like i, I yeah. did my i did my job you know duty and things but there's a line i feel like that we don't cross yeah and that line is putting bombs on little kids do you think that they cross that line because they're in a place of desperation? Not to justify that, but... It, it, no, I think they use people the same way that a cult does. The people that end up with the side vessel are the people that came to them with mental health problems or like didn't have a family and stuff right. like that. Yeah. It's not the... It ain't not a bit... Like, it's not Bin Laden's son you know yeah. I mean, doing that. Yeah. So, so they're preying on people. Yes. Yeah. That's who they're recruiting for their for their camps, for their training camps. It's It's that... People that come from that background. Really? Mm -hmm. That that's a rare group of people that yes. are, are even like that. Yeah. yeah, they're looking for people that are going to go go for that. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You interacted with a lot of people on the ground. You mean Afghanis? Yeah, civilians? yeah. No, yeah. you don't really. You don't really want to. In the market, the outdoor bazaar, but yeah, but you don't want to do too much wandering Friday. around because yeah. the last contractors that they snatched up over there, they drug them from the back of a truck until their skin came off. And then they hung them from a bridge and set them on fire. So you don't want to mess around like out in town too much there. You kind of want to stay in the fence if you can. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's You're in a that... place where you're surrounded by an entire country of people that want to kill you. When you think about the contractors, that's something that they don't report, like the number of casualties. They Correct. say, oh, well, this is right. the number of soldiers that have died. That doesn't it's not count. the real number. And they wanted to send a message, like, because contractors do it, like I made $3,000 a week over there. So they're sending a message like, you're not going to find a treasure over here. You know, don't come over here thinking you're going to make money off of, you know, our blood or whatever. So right. They, they, they try to make a strong statement if they get a contractor. Yeah. 
because nobody forced the contractor to go over there. Like you're not bound by like you chose. Like I chose to go to Jalalabad, yeah, which is right on the Pakistani border. I could have picked different different places as a contractor. I didn't have to go where they tell me to go. Yeah, I picked that place for a reason. Did you want to get the fuck out of there? After my second trip, I was pretty much done with it. Yeah, I had my son after that too. So right. once I having a kid changes you to a degree. You, yeah, you totally. want to you want to come home to your kid, and you don't want to make anybody else not come home to their kid. Yeah. So a lot of soldiers love it, and they they, right. they don't want to leave. I dealt with that to a degree. Yeah, like I picked Jalalabad. You know, they had we had palaces that we took over from Saddam Hussein in Iraq. I could have took orders there, and they got like air conditioning and movie theaters and swimming pools and stuff on these mm. bases. And I picked Jalalabad, which is right along the Pakistani border, uh, because that's where the specific list of people that were responsible for 9-11 were hiding. Hmm. So I, I picked there and I lived in a tent in the mountains. Wow. Uh, instead of, you know, in this, on, a, in a, on a nicer base in the green For how zone. long did you live in that tent? I did, about, I did two trips there, a total of a little bit over nine months. And doing there you were doing more drone stuff? Yeah, all the dr all drone stuff. All drone stuff. Yeah. That's what you did the entire mm -hmm. time. Yeah. So my, my second trip there was summertime, and it was a little bit more intense. There's a more action in the summer because there's not snow in the mountains. They can move about and get supplies through everywhere. And uh, it was an election year, so uh, they didn't want people voting, obviously, because we set up their democracy. Right. And they, you know, they have their own form of government. And right. People forget that, like, so much of that country is rural, yeah. and we never had any control over it. We just had the, the couple major cities. Yeah. So the things operated to business as usual for most of that country the whole time we were there. Yeah. Um, and they obviously they didn't want people participating in that election because to them it was a sham. Yeah. So they stepped up the attacks so people would be afraid to to get involved. How many targets would you hit per week? Not a lot. It's not like you think it is where you see a war movie and it's constant action. Yeah. If you take a two and a half hour war movie, yeah. that's like six months of action. Yeah. Right there. It's a lot of sitting around bored and then all of a sudden yeah. it's like, oh, we're going to fire a missile. Yeah. We followed a guy in a truck for three days one time and they blew the truck up while I was at lunch. Really? Yeah, I went, I went to eat and, and it was gone when I got back, so I kind of missed that. But was there, was there any close calls, like people getting the drop on you or anything like that? Yeah, yeah actually, we, I was there one day. I got a picture of the mushroom cloud behind me uh, we were, we were in the GCS, the ground control station and just the built, just a large boom and the building shook. And I thought somebody ran a truck into the building cause that happened once before. Wow. And I go outside and there's a huge mushroom cloud on the other side of our fence. My fob Ford operating base was just a three and a half mile, uh, diameter fence with cha it's a chain link fence and a bunch of tents. That's mm. it. And we're in the middle of the mountains. So we put a bird up in the air, a uh, uh, UAV, and we're looking down to see what it is. <clears throat> and there's these three underground bunkers that we didn't even know were there, right outside of our fence where they had been stockpiling weapons. Mm. Probably, to, it didn't occur to me until years later that they were stockpiling all that stuff so they could try to overrun the fob. Right. And if they hadn't blown themselves up on accident, they probably would have succeeded. Wow. So they blew the first bunker up, a huge mushroom cloud. And then smoke was coming out of the second one. I'm watching this through the Predator camera. And you can see people just dragging like ammo cans and stuff out of it. Wow. And yeah, if they hadn't, like I said, if they hadn't blown it up themselves, we might not have even known it. Like I, I might not. How might they right have now. done that? I have no idea. Yeah. I have, they could have been there smoking a cigarette or something. I have no idea. The first Jesus one blew Christ. up. Yeah. Like one big boom. The yeah. second one had smoke coming out of it. Yeah. And they were trying to drag stuff out of it. They were pretty disorganized. Yeah. They're yeah. honestly, they really like war and they're not good at it. <laughs> they're really bad at it like i'll give you an example what they blew up an entire block of muslims like killed 30 over 30 of their own people and got two u.s soldiers and they would call that a win they would call that a win they would call that a win for them if we go out and we lose one dude on a mission we feel like we we got to go back and figure out what went wrong you yeah know? so it's a whole different operational standard for that wow that's so fucked up. Like they yeah. really don't give a shit about their no own No value on human life. Yeah. Um, so how long were you there total? Nine months, about nine months total. Nine months total. In Jalalabad, total. yeah. And that's two trips? Two trips. I went for, uh, split it in half. I came back for a couple months and then went back again. Mm -hmm. And then when you came home, were you already into fighting or did you get into it after? No, I got into it after my second trip to Afghanistan. Um, like I said, I met Diego and I kind of needed something to fill in that 
like we said, if you yeah, don't, if you don't totally. have whatever you need to, to, to get your, it's like, it's kind of like my therapy. That's how you end up getting in fights in the bar and stuff like that. Yeah. So do you I got PTSD? into it. Hmm? Do you deal with PTSD? I, I do, but I consider myself lucky because I, I have some friends and people I know that it's like debilitating yeah. and I can deal with mine for the most part. How is it debilitating for them? Just guys that can't, you know, can't be in a crowd, don't, can't be around loud noises, can't deal with stress, you know? Yeah. When you respond, we, a lot of anger issues, yeah. you know what I mean? And then you deal with the shame from that. They come home and they don't want to be a monster to their family, you know? Yeah. Uh, and it's hard to, you think you're learning a skill set that's in addition to the person you were, and instead you're changing into a different person. Yeah. And you never go back to the old person again. Yeah. And that's the thing that people deal with when they get back. Yeah. That I'm not the same person I was before, and I don't know wow. how to be that person again. Wow. And you deal with that on a smaller scale. Yeah. I feel like I processed everything fairly well. You know yeah. what I mean? I got I deal with what I deal with, but growing up in the environment that you grew up in, it kind of maybe acclimated you to that. Probably. Yeah. 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 To a degree of accepting sort of just some of the realities. Yeah. Know? Like it's a war, you expect certain things to happen. Yeah. But there's a side of your mind that you don't have any control over. Like we yeah. were saying, like how some people love either it seems like they love it or they can't not go back again for another deployment i dealt with a little bit of guilt because i was still able-bodied after my last deployment right and i didn't go back again right and so you know in the military they teach you that you're part of a machine and when you take one piece of the machine out that's when the machine breaks down and people start dying so i didn't watch the news for a long time because you know if, if you watch the news and six people died in afghanistan you know it's a war and people are going to die, but then the other side of your brain says you're not doing your job, and that's why people are dying. Wow. So there's a little bit of that also. These wars are so different than wars like the right. Vietnam it's War. Not, it's not World War One where everybody comes up yeah, out of the yeah, trench yeah. and dies immediately. Yeah. Right? Like if you know five guys die in a week, that's a that's a major week. Yes. Maybe for one base. I don't know that there was ever a week in, in the whole war where only five people died. It's still right. a lot of a how, lot many, of how many people are dying a week? I, I would, I'd have to look into that. I, like I said, I try to stay away from yeah, reading totally, that stuff. I get it, so. yeah. But you're saying it's more dangerous living in Birmingham. That was probably my perception. Yeah. You know, just being uh, growing up there as a teenager and seeing like people shot and like laying on the ground. It seems more. Weirdly, more less. I felt I felt more in danger. Yeah, there maybe less that predictable, was... maybe because you don't have like uh, you don't have this organization protecting you. You don't have these right. guys protecting. You. It's just right. You. That's yeah. Excellent point. Yeah. 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 You're kind of to a degree, you know. And then also, there's the when you're on a deployment, like you have an end date. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Where you know, like I got to make it to this day. When you live somewhere, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. Right. That's just what you're going to be dealing with forever. Yeah. So. You never went to jail? I've been in eight different jails. Oh, eight different jails. Eight different jails. Yeah. Jail, not prison. There's a difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I've been in all small shit, dumb shit. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, I, after a while, I was getting in so much trouble, I just stopped going to court after a while. Yeah. And then I had to leave. It was all before, all, all before you hit the military. Some of it after. Some of it after. I came back from the military and moved back to my hometown. Because I remember, I kind of missed it, to be honest. And then I yeah. get there and I'm like, oh, this is not you where it's at. I remembered it through the eyes of a child. And I go home and it's like, my friends are either getting out of prison or going to prison yeah. or dying. Yeah. And like, everybody's struggling, like no matter how hard they try. And I'm like, yeah. this is not, I should go back to San Diego. So and then you went, I, so, you went to San Diego. Yeah, I was kind of looking for a sign. I kept getting in trouble, even though I was trying to stay in trouble. Me and one other friend had a normal job. Everybody else I knew were stick-up kids. They just robbed people. Yeah. And my buddy Terrell worked at, at the Honda plant. That's the only two people I know that had a were actually trying. And I still went to jail like every other month. Just going out with my friends, getting in a fight at the bar, you know, just yeah. dumb shit, you know? Yeah. Um, and I got I caught a pistol charge there because again you don't want to be in caught with that one rolling around without a gun. Yeah. You know I mean? But you don't want to get caught with one either. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know I kept thinking like this is not what I want for myself. I should go back to San Diego. I just had it in the back of my mind. I still had friends out there. And then one day I was sitting in my my apartment and it was August and it gets hot in the south in August and my air yeah. conditioning started making a funny sound and I was like don't fucking do it. It died. And it died. And that was it. That was a Monday. <laughs> I quit my job on Wednesday and I left that Friday. I put my dog in the car, gave all my shit away and drove to San Diego. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I was like, that's it. Fuck that shit. Yeah. I, was like, I was like looking for a sign and I was like, God, give me a sign. And then it just started making this rattling sound. And I was like, I'm out. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, thank God too. It worked out since then. So once you touch down in San Diego, what do you what do you start? I had a couple friends out here. I didn't have a job or anything. I got out here. I was driving my seventy one Le Mans. I get out here and I just started applying to stuff. I had my background, my military background, right? Uh, and I hadn't been in any major trouble back home. It was all misdemeanors, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think two weeks in, I got a job with General Atomics with the drone stuff. Okay. So I moved back out to San Diego after my active duty military. Uh -huh. And that's when I went to Afghanistan twice doing the drones. Got it. So I, I split all of that up. And so the, the second time you come back, the second time you go back to San Diego. Right. That's when I got into jujitsu. So you're, uh, you're just riding through LA. Yeah. 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 I got the match in Vegas tomorrow. So tell me about the match in Vegas that you have. Yeah. It's the high rollers event. <clears throat> Like I said, it's a, kind of like a stoner jiu-jitsu fusion event, but they get a cool crowd in there. Um, like I said, Mike Tyson has his 2.0 brand, and uh, the guys that I that I work with at Originals, I think, do the growing for that. So yeah, long story short, you go in there. There's a lot of UFC fighters that are involved in it. Also, they either compete there because they go they do jiu-jitsu tournaments, you know, on the side or in their downtime. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's just a fun time. It's a fun time. You uh, you do matches like that a lot so how old are you yeah i'm 41 now i didn't even start jujitsu until i was 29 yeah do you find a lot of older guys like competing so uh yes and no uh some it seems like it has Fight more sports. to do with like the rank once people start getting some rank brown belts and black belts for whatever reason don't yeah. want to lose especially if they have students or a gym they don't want to lose for whatever reason yeah my thought process is just different on it you know yeah i out there not to necessarily win the medal right i'm out there to like number one to keep myself sharp yeah learn some things about myself you know well it's uh, funny because about... fight sports are not something that people get into in their teens typically right because it's not like they do fight sports in schools you right. know right, right, right. and so like uh it's something that people pick up later in life and then it takes 10 years to even get a black belt so to compete at a high level mm -hmm. like you know, you're usually going to be in your 30s when you actually even reach that point, right. you know? Keep in mind, you don't have to wait till your black belt to start competing. I started as a white belt. You compete right. against other white belts. And a lot of even professional MMA fighters aren't necessarily black, black belts, belts in jiu-jitsu. Yeah. You know, they got to train everything, so it's hard to, yeah. to get there. You kind of have what your base is going to be. Yeah. Like a lot of guys, maybe they're kickboxers, but they also have to do a little jiu-jitsu, you know? Yeah. Or jiu-jitsu guys that can't be completely useless on the feet either, you know? Right. And they get slept before they even get the fight to the ground. But if someone's, like, good at jiu-jitsu, mm -hmm. that's, like Diego said, like, that's going to be right. hard for well, anyone to really compete because you can get in right. a position that there's no training. Right to get in, in that and position. Most people that start jujitsu quit after blue belt, after they get their blue belt. I think maybe 13, 14% of people that start jujitsu ever make it past blue belt. So blue belt is what the second belt. Yeah. Is that um, pretty easy to get? No, no, no. It takes, a, it took me a year and a half to get my blue belt and I was competing every month. I won yeah. three gold medals in one month and I got right. a stripe on my belt. Right. So it's not, it's not like karate where you can go in there and break a board and get a belt or yeah. something like that. Or like, you know, I meet people and they're like, oh yeah, my seven year old is a black belt and whatever. And I'm like, it's not the same thing. Yeah. 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 Uh, so what, yeah. what does it take to get these belts? So there's different criteria. This, that's the, one of the things that I like about jujitsu, there's no specific test, right? It's up to your professor. So they're looking at how do you perform against people within your gym? How do you perform against people outside your gym? If you compete, and what's your aptitude for like self-defense? Like the sport side of jiu-jitsu is all well and good, but you need to be able to use it in practical application. Right. Can you do that or not? Is mm -hmm. a good is a good test to whether or not you're ready for the next belt. Uh, how long have you been actually competing in MMA? I I don't do MMA. I don't do cage fighting. I just do the jiu-jitsu. Just jiu-jitsu. Yeah, got, got competing got in jiu-jitsu. I started. Let's see. I've been doing this for twelve years. I think I did my first tournament six months in as a white belt, which is probably a little early that's really uh, early yeah, yeah but i just wanted to try i didn't even know there, that jiu-jitsu was a sport i yeah. just knew about the gracies and mma and like the self-defense aspect of it uh -huh. and then i got into it and i think when i after i started training like some of my teammates were getting ready for a tournament uh -huh. and i was like what's that i didn't do the very first one but i did the second one right and uh it's scary but it's also so much fun like, you're very nervous leading up to your matches uh -huh. and then right afterwards all you can't wait to do it again yeah uh it's like pretty much your life now yeah. Like, yeah. One of my first professors told me that jujitsu is not a hobby. It's a lifestyle. Yeah. So, and, and that's why so few people make a past blue because they're like, okay, well, 
this is my hobby. I kind of did the thing that I wanted right. to do with this you, hobby. To go further, you have to really kind of right. change your entire lifestyle. You either have, you have to, to look get at dedicated. it. Yeah. Good point. You either have yeah. to look at it like this is just something I'm going to do for exercise, in yeah. which case you can forget about making belts. Yeah. And you shouldn't be, if that's not what you're after, then be happy with your blue belt yeah. and just go in there and train, learn self-defense, stay in shape. Yeah. But I think a lot of times when people realize like what it's going to take as far as like the level of dedication to start getting purple and belt yeah. brown belt then they you gotta kind of have to choose like am, do is, i really want this to take up that much of my energy and time which belts are like the, the hardest leap like between um, one belt to the next for me i think i was a blue belt for two and a half years just because like, i went i took the hard road you know my professors don't don't hand out belts fast you know some people you know everybody has different criteria like you really gotta gotta put the work in and um, so blue to purple was rough for me. Once you make purple belt, you kind of know the moves. It starts to be more about other things. Like, can you make the people around you better? Mm -hmm. Are you a good teammate? Are you able to teach this, you know, to other people? Who, who's given the right to anoint people with belts? A professor. So once you get your black belt and you've been teaching for a year as a teacher, as a black belt, then you get professor bars. Yeah. Then you can promote people. Got it. So there's, there's a process for that too. And to get a black belt, does it have to be reviewed by multiple professors? No, it just no, has to be your one professor. professor can yeah, do one that. guy. Yeah. So, but that, and then all that comes into account, like your lineage is important too. So, like if you have a professor that just hands out belts to whoever, you know, does exist. Is it, yeah, I mean, more so now. I think, you know, you, there's so much out there. Like jujitsu has exploded. Yeah. Really. So, certainly there must be guys out there that yeah. just maybe they, they promoted their homie a little early yeah. or they got a, you know, yeah. whatever situations. So, how do you feel like jujitsu's like made you a better person? Um, the lessons you learn in martial arts, you can apply to life. You know, Give when me you an first example. start out, before you learn how to kick people's asses, you learn how to take an ass whipping. Yeah. So when you're brand new, it doesn't matter how tough you are, you're going to get smashed yeah. just because you haven't learned. Like I put my right hand here, I put my left hand here and I push this way and I can break this guy's arm. Yeah. You don't know any of that. So you're just at the mercy of anybody with two weeks more training than you. Yeah. And after you've just been getting smashed, like maybe one day instead of tapping in this position, you hang in there a little bit longer and you figure out how to get out and yeah. then you get a sweep and now you're on top. And this yeah. guy's, you can see this fear in his eyes and he's breathing hard because he put everything he had into finishing in you and it didn't work. Yeah. When you unlock that in your mind, you think, if I can dig myself out of this hole, I can, whatever I got going on in my life, yeah. I can dig myself out of that hole too, totally, you yeah. know? Or let's yeah. say... You know, you go, you go compete and you just get scrubbed. You get drug up and down the mat. You know, a lot of it is learning how to pick yourself back up and go again. Right. And that helps you in That's life too. Huge. Maybe you don't yeah. get the job interview. And yeah. instead of thinking maybe this isn't for me, yeah. you just go to the next one, you know? Go, yeah, exactly. So a lot Great. of it. Perseverance. Yeah. And that, I teach the kids classes myself too at my gym. And that's a lot of like that's what cool. I'm trying to package it for them cool. as. Like this yeah. is not, I'm not just teaching you how to fuck people up. Yeah. You know, I'm teaching you how to pick yourself up and go again. Yeah. So. When you, uh, when you get your ass kicked in jujitsu, like it's painful, like you're getting your ass whooped, like. Yeah, you feel like you've been in a car wreck the next it's day. Because, it's because they're just bending your arm in ways that it's not supposed to be bent. And, and you're stuff. getting slammed on the ground, just doing, yeah. dr drilling. Like even if, you're, even if you're not sparring, you're just drilling, wrestling, hitting the ground over and over and over, especially right. the older you get. Like yeah. you, you wake up the next day and everything hurts. Yeah. And then just having similar somebody. similar to wrestling. Having somebody come down on you, boom, slam yeah. on you and just. Uh, inside the gym, we don't do weight classes like you do it when you compete. You go by belt level, age group, weight class. In the gym, it's everybody going with everybody. So if you're going with somebody that's 300 pounds, nothing feels worse than you can't even expand your chest to get air into your lungs because this person's so heavy laying yeah. on you. Uh, yeah, it's rough. Just And then all the pressure, like a lot of it is shoulder pressure. People will put their, right. grind their elbow into your yep. eye socket, put all the, the shoulder into your stuff. jaw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. Uh, um, a lot of the same stuff you would experience with wrestling, with yeah. jiu -jitsu, except also you're getting your arm twisted off Yeah. at the same time. So like, did they, these lessons that you learned through jujitsu help you directly from like your experience in the military and like, kind of like, absolutely how they left you when you came out after that? Right. Like, absolutely. Um, it replaced for me, you know, there's, there's a big sense of like being on the team when you're in the military, especially when you have to rely on each other uh to get through something and you're missing that when you come back everybody mm -hmm. goes their own directions when you get back so mm -hmm. you're sort of left with a feeling of what's my purpose now did you did you keep in touch with those people 
some of them yeah some of them some of them for a while and then people just drift apart you yeah know? yeah um that's one of the good things about like having people on social media now more than anything else other than just like putting your picture out there as like being able to keep in contact with people and say totally. oh man this guy he had a second kid you know uh stuff like that so yeah it's, Good to, and then you can reach out to people that yeah. way. So a couple of them, but not not many. And you said like some of them aren't doing so hot, like with their PTSD and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. and then even not the people that I served with, like yeah. being in the the martial arts community, you have a lot of veterans in that yeah, community. Yeah, I bet. That probably found their way there the same way I did. Yeah. And uh, so that's one of the benefits of it. It's given me a way to reconnect with veterans in yeah. a way where I can try to be of service yeah. because you know we've gotten phone calls like i do free training for veterans with ptsd and counseling and stuff we've got phone calls from guys that are outside in the parking lot about to blow their brains out oh you know? no jesus uh, yeah 22 yeah. veterans a day commit suicide is that true yep every day 22 a day wow that's so, wild it's an opportunity to, to try to get back into that and um and give like when i opened the gym it, I knew whatever I did with myself because I worked in aerospace for like I went into commercial aviation when I got back from Afghanistan, and the sense of purpose isn't the same because uh, that's just about making money, you right. know. And I knew whatever I did for business couldn't just be about making money. I had to be of service. Yeah. So this helped me find my purpose again too. Um, that's really cool. Yeah, it was important to me because you kind of feel lost for a little bit, like. The stakes, the stakes will never be as high as they are when the loss of human life is the consequence for you messing up. Absolutely. It doesn't matter if you're moving millions of dollars around. It ain't the same. Yeah. So being able to take and get back with the veterans and teach people self-defense, something that could help them or help kids. You know, I, I honestly believe if we can reach enough kids before life kind of gets to them, kind of like the way it did when I was a teenager, that that's how you can change things. Absolutely. A culture or a community. So, so it's, it's the, the root cause of pretty much all the problems. You know? Yeah, it yeah. really is. Yeah. Um, so I feel like a, a, an ability for me to, like at the end of the day, I want to feel like I did good while I was here. Well, I think it's really cool that it kind of made you like appreciate what's really important, you know? Right. Like you went through something that's really grueling and a lot of people like don't make it out in one piece, literally. Right. And... Um, you know, it, it, it reoriented you. It, it, ma it made you unable to live a life that didn't have anything, you know, a purpose. Right. You know? And also maybe like a little bit of redemption. You know what I mean? There's, yeah. a, there's a skill set yeah. that you may, when you get back, you may realize that this skill set that you have may never be good for anything but doing bad with. Yeah. And then you learn that maybe some of these skills and some of these abilities, capabilities that you have, you can apply in a way that has a positive outcome. Like maybe you are teaching people how to fight, but it's, it's meant to be for self-defense. And then there's also the side of it, like martial arts, really, the real benefit isn't learning self-defense, it's that it's a vehicle for self-evolution. Yeah, it's the person you become. A lot of people get to my age and you just are what you are. You get up and you do the same thing every day and you come home and you eat dinner and you watch a show and you go to bed. And when you do martial arts, it's never finished. Right. So your mind stays in growth mode. Yeah. And for me, that's huge. That's life. Because when you stop, that's when you start dying, man. Absolutely. You know, literally like people retire and then they die like yep. right after that, you know, you're never done. You're never finished. Right. And that's true for any craft. You know, if you, if you, if you treat it that way, you could find that, that self-development right in it in really committing yourself to anything right there's know? always a way that either somebody else is pioneering it or there's new things or yeah. new ways of doing yeah. it you know yeah and it's just it's at the end of the day just facing yourself yes it's Very facing so. yourself and not bullshitting yourself mm -hmm. and like really facing your fears head on yeah yeah and it, it's a it's a training ground for like going out there and fighting life you mm -hmm. know like i said when you learn how to pick yourself up and go again that's a skill set when you develop the skill set, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good, yeah. Uh, this is why how I explain to the kids is that life is not. We tend to take things personally, like life in general. Like I grew up in that city, uh, and uh, you know, I had friends go to prison. I had friends die. My little brother got murdered in Birmingham, and you can sort of like start to take things personally. My mom died after that, you know. Uh, she started self-medicating after my brother died and fell asleep at the wheel and crashed. Wow. And you can start to think like, why is life doing this to me? And it ain't got nothing to do with you. But when you develop a process for overcoming obstacles, right. that process will work for you no matter what it is. 
So your success and failure in life is not about what cards you get dealt or what obstacles you had to overcome. Right. It's about, do you have a process for overcoming obstacles or not? And right. That's something you get from martial arts. It's all about problem solving. And your, your process is just simply getting back up and, and yep. moving. I put one foot in front of the other until I get what I'm going. Yeah. I don't worry about the, the overall task because that makes it overwhelming. I right. do step one. When I'm done with step one, I do step two. Right. Yeah. It's a great message. Thank you. Chris, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, like you. This was Appreciate an incredible it. conversation. Thank you for the opportunity.